Hello everyone, in this video we are going to be talking about hypertensive crisis. And instead of explaining the disease section by section, we are going to discuss it upon a real patient who has just arrived at the emergency department. It might be more understanding and give us a better outlook of how does hypertensive crisis act and work in our body, okay? So let's start our journey in the emergency department as a doctor. Imagine you're in your room as visiting a patient. Suddenly you hear an ambulance sound has just arrived at the emergency department right now, okay? The paramedic comes to you and begins to explain what has happened and what's the history of the patient. He tells you that the patient is a 44-year-old woman uh, who went shopping with her friend this evening. Uh, while she was walking with her friend alongside the road, she suddenly felt dizziness and a severe attack of headache, okay? After seeing this, her friend immediately called for an ambulance. This even was for about one hour ago, okay? Uh, while the paramedic is talking to you, she herself with her friend comes into your room. Now she's kind of feel better after the paramedic gave her sublingual nitroglycerin uh, and some kind of supplemental oxygen, okay? Now she's kind of better and she can talk. She also tells the doctor that she has had frequent attacks of headache and a slight feeling of dizziness over the last month. She also visited another doctor last week. He prescribed her some kind of antivertical medication that we know as betahistine and also paracetamol for controlling her headache. But it wasn't enough and she's still suffering from those disturbing and those annoying symptoms, okay? She also tells the doctor that she has no diseases, she has no disorder, she takes no medication, and she has never experienced such a disturbing symptoms over her entire life, okay? Now this is the scenario you have faced at the emergency department. What's your plan and what would you do for the patient? It might be more understanding and better if you design your plan first for this patient, write down whatever you have got in your mind or just have it in your mind, then keep watching the rest of the video. And if you like this kind of video, you can hit the like button, you can comment down below in the comment box for us that what we are gonna do, what's your idea, how can we improve our videos? And also you can press the bell button so you'll be informed about other upcoming videos. All right, after taking you through history, the next step the doctor gonna do is assess the physical examination, okay? And as the first step of the physical examination, the doctor must assess the general appearance. And what is this term? General appearance is defined as anything the doctor must realize from the patient at the first sight, like a level of consciousness, the body posture, body gesture, uh, any kind of discomfort like pain, anxiety, and whatever else, whatever else the doctor can realize at the first sight. For example, for this patient, she's kind of pale at the first sight. Uh, she breathes a little bit more deeper and higher than normal rate. Uh, and she's kind of restless. Uh, and obviously, you can see the sweat drops rolling down off her forehead, okay? And nothing else can be seen. Now, let's go to the next step of physical examination. That is vital signs. The doctor took her blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure was 250 and the diastolic one was 130. It's severely high blood pressure, okay? The pulse rate was 72 per minute. The respiratory rate was 80 per minute. There is no sign of fever. Temperature is normal. And saturation of oxygen was 98% with no supplemental oxygen. Now it is time to go to the next step and last step after physical examination, which is body organ examinations, okay? And as you know, it's kind of time consuming and it's not necessary in this kind of video to access all of the body organ from head to toe, okay? Uh, so instead of that, we are gonna focus on just some targeted organ that are needed to be examined. Uh, actually in this patient, all of the body organ examination were completely normal. And as one of the most common organs, that is heart, uh, we just uh, gonna do cardiac auscultation, okay? As you can hear, there is no extra sound, there is no murmur, there is no gallop. Um, S1 and S2 can clearly be heard. The heart rate is kinda in, in a normal range, so it's completely normal, okay? So obviously we have faced a hypertensive crisis, okay? And what is this term? Whenever a patient got a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure higher than 180 
or diastolic blood pressure higher than 120, we consider this as hypertensive crisis, okay? And uh, this is an emergency situation and we must hurry up. We must do whatever is needed as soon as possible for the patient, okay? This problem usually happens in this kind of patient who have had chronic hypertension for a long time. For example, for two or three months or even for in some, or even in some cases for several years, okay? Uh, and they may have not any symptoms and live a long life with no complication. But at the other side, some patient may end up like this patient we have got uh, and now they are struggling with a hypertensive crisis. So, so we know that the most common cause of hypertensive crisis is an idiopathic rise in the setting of chronic hypertension, okay? Another common reason for hypertensive crisis is inadequate treatment, okay? Uh, in those kind of patients who start their medication just based on their own opinion with no consultant to, to any doctor, uh, or some patients that don't care about their treatment and they do not take any kind of antihypertensive medications, okay? So, uh, and probably you usually see this kind of patient wherever you are working. Okay, now look at it a bit shown up here. Uh, there are two major types of causes or reasons for hypertensive crisis. The first type is primary type, uh, like we have just said now, like inadequate treatment or a patient with chronic hypertension. And another type is secondary hypertension. Uh, and the reason uh, here are listed that you can see like renal diseases, endocrine diseases, patients who have got uh, some kind of special medications and so on, okay? So whenever you got a patient with hypertensive crisis, you should consider all this reason in your mind and put all workers which is needed to evaluate this reason in your management plan, okay? All right, now what is really important to know is two major and two different types of hypertensive crisis, okay? The first type is hypertensive urgency. We use this term whenever the patient has hypertensive crisis with no complication, with no organ damage, and probably they are asymptomatic, okay? Uh, but whenever a target damage being added to hypertensive urgency, it's become hypertensive emergency. At least one organ damage, it can be even more, like renal diseases, like endocrine diseases, like in the setting of preeclampsia in pregnant women, or, or those kind of patients who have uh, just take uh, some specific medications, okay? These are all hypertensive emergency. These two types of hypertensive crisis both are really dangerous and need emergent intervention, okay? But the emergency, hypertensive emergency one is far more dangerous and can be fatal sometime. So we must have all our plans done immediately, okay? As we say, it's really important to have all our plans done and put all them in our workups and in our management plan as soon as possible because it's an emergency situation. First of all, we gotta take an electrocardiograph to find out if there is any cardiac issue. Here, shown up here, you can see the EKG result. There is no abnormality. Uh, it has normal sinus rhythm, no arrhythmia, no ischemia, and everything sounds good here, okay? Then according to this table, all of this write down here should be done for all of the patients with hypertensive crisis, okay? Uh, for example, in the renal panel, we are gonna check the serum urea, electrolytes, and serum creatinine, okay? Full blood count and blood film should be done uh, for um, any possible anemia. Urine analysis should be done if there is any sign of hematuria exists. And finally, chest x-ray to rule out some possible culprits like pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, and cardiomegaly or cardiac enlargement. All of these tests are done for the patient and all of them were normal, okay? In this patient, according to her history of blurred vision, uh, it's super important to have her examined by an ophthalmologist, okay? And it must be done as soon as possible be uh, because it's an emergency situation. Uh, maybe she has got papilloedema, retinal detachment, retinal hemorrhage, and so on. So never let any sign and symptom stay unchecked or ignored because it might be end up a life-threatening condition for the patient. There are some other proclinic tests that is shown here in this table that is not required for all patients. And we just consider them in special cases. For example, we may order pregnancy tests in preeclampsia setting or toxicology screening tests if you suspect the patient is drug addicted and other tests that are shown in this table. 
here is the term that's really necessary to now uh, to have our treatment plan better and safe. Okay, and what is it? It is called auto regulation. And what is this term? Actually, auto regulation is like a manager or moderator in our body uh, for adjusting the blood flow reaching any of our organs. Okay. It helps our body remain its constant blood flow despite of any change in our blood pressure and despite of any change in pre perfusion pressure, okay? For example, when our body faces a high blood pressure like this patient, uh, the artery regulation response begins to constrict the arterioles. So arterioles become narrowed, okay? The lumen will become narrowed. So it helps the organs to remain their blood flow despite of the high blood pressure, okay? As much as the blood pressure goes higher and higher, the auto regulation response begins to fail more and more, okay? And finally, it reaches a point that it cannot compensate anymore. So higher blood pressure is gonna break down the auto regulation response and gonna damage the vascular endothelium, okay? And this lead to uh, plasma goes inside the wall of the capillaries and arterioles. If auto regulation breaks down in the brain, it's gonna end up cerebral edema and it's really dangerous and life-threatening and it happen and if it happens in any other organs uh, it might end up destroying that organ and cause end organ damage okay so why the auto regulation response is that much important for us see as hypertension is treated and blood pressure falls over time rapidly uh, auto regulation is still active okay and maintain the blood flow of organ like when the blood pressure was high Actually, it needs more time to get adopted to the new situation, right? So, sudden fall in blood pressure, while the auto regulation has yet kept the arterioles constricted, is really dangerous. And it might lead to organ hypoperfusion and finally lead to ischemia. And at the end of the stage, it might lead to organ necrosis. That is why the hypertension should be lowered gradually, especially if uh, it's in the setting of chronic hypertension. Uh, because it's been a while that body is adopted to this condition. So we are just allowed to lower down the blood pressure for about 25% of mean arterial pressure or MAP in the hypertensive urgency at the first hour. Okay. And for hypertensive emergency, this is a little bit less for about between 10 to 20%. Okay. And after the first hour, we are just allowed to lower down the blood pressure for 5 to 15% of MAP for the next 23 hours. Okay, now let's get back to our patient who is waiting for us. Actually, all this has been said as should be processed in the doctor's mind as soon as possible and in the shortest time because we might miss the golden time for the patient. Our patient told us a history of headache and dizziness and these are actually kind of can indicate an encephalopathy and the blurred vision can be a sign of retinopathy, okay? So regardless of the patient is kind of appears normal and she can talk, uh, she's kind of normal, she must be admitted in the intense care unit, okay? Uh, because this is a hypertensive emergency. The mean arterial pressure or MAP for this patient is about 170, okay? If you use this formula shown here. So we better lower up to 20% of MAP for the first hour. That is actually between 30 to 40, okay? And we can also lower the diastolic pressure to 100 or 110 over the first hour. And if the patient is stable after the first hour, we can drop down the blood pressure to about 160 over 100 for the next 24 hours. As much as we do this over time and gradually, the risk of any complication would be lower. Okay, now let's see what we have got for the treatment. In this kind of patient, we should use uh, short-acting antihypertensive agents, okay? Why? Because whenever the patient reveals any sign of hypertension, uh, we can stop the medication infusion and avoid any further drop down in the blood pressure uh, because the medication is short acting. And as we stop the infusion, the drug effect will be stopped too. For example, we can use nitroprusside uh, that allows us to minute to minute control over the blood pressure for this patient, okay? Uh, here in this table shown here, you can see the preferred medication for any selected hypertensive emergencies. And as it's shown, our preferred medication for hypertensive encephalopathy that can be any of nitroprusside, nicardipine, or labetalol. 
If you kind of face any types of hypertensive emergencies, except encephalopathy, it's better to lower down pressure over a longer time rather than minutes, okay? We can do this by repeating frequent doses of short-acting medications. Again, it's necessary to be said, reducing the blood pressure rapidly uh, and aggressively must be avoided, okay? It might be life-threatening and fatal. In this table shown up here, you also can see what dose of the antihypertensive medication you gotta be prescribing for the patient in different conditions, okay? But never forget, this all should be done under delicate supervision of the doctor to manage or any possible calming side effects. Now, let's get our patient the best medication and the best dose. As you can see here, the labetalol, which is one of our choices, and it may be the best choice, uh, it would be given at first by 20 mg as a slow IV bolus over 2 minutes, a slow IV infusion over 2 minutes, then we can add 40 to 80 milligram either at 10 minutes intervals. But remember and be careful that we are just allowed to give any patient just 300 milligram of labetalol for 24 hours. If the medication we have chosen didn't resolve the hypertension, we should add another medication with adjusted dose and reassess the patient again if uh, there is any underlying cause and that we have not uh, realized yet, okay? Finally, over 24 hours of getting IV infusion of labetalol, finally all of the symptoms settled over and she was put on um, oral antihypertensive medication that we are going to talk about it in another video that how and what kind of antihypertensive medication we are going to be prescribing for patients. Hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If it's so, so press the like button comment down below in the comment box and help us improve our videos and also you can hit the bell button so you'll be informed about other videos that we are gonna upload in our channel stay tuned